this Zoom replay was originally streamed autumn 2020 and is brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community and viewers like you. Because I got an email from someone else in Dharamsala about would I give a talk in honor of His Holiness? It seems to be an entire year where people are dedicated to well, honoring think, him. Is that what's going on? I think that our thing, you know, about this uh, thing about the Global Vision Summit that we did with Lions Roar, which is now playing, I think every, all the Tibetans got the idea to, and they wanted to get in and do something more. And then also they added the fourth aim of His Holiness to the three aims that we focus on, because the fourth one is the recent one, where His Holiness is into like, you know, getting Indians to re-adopt that aspect of their civilization, you know, which got lost about a thousand years ago, you know, when Buddhism more or less disappeared from Indian soil with the, with the entry of the, you know, the uh, Persians and the Arabs and things, you know, and the Buddhist monasteries were burned and so on. And so uh, there was a big, a big move. So his own is, is like into being a son of India now, and he wants um, he wants the Indians to realize that Buddhist knowledge, like the Tibetans have been carefully cherishing and preserving for thousands of years, as also they did in Sri Lanka, but that really it's really from India originally, and it is Indian knowledge is not just some other religion. In other words, it's their own knowledge especially the sort of psychological Abhidharma, you know, science parts of it, you know. And um, so that's his fourth aim, you know, is to be a son of India. You know, and he has that thing where he says he's had more rice and dal in the last uh, 60 years than, than the first 25 years where he had Momo in Tibet. <laughs> so he's more made of Indian food. He's the son of India, you know, and son of Nalanda University, the great monastic university and so on. So he makes a big fuss about that. Anyway, here we are. So yeah, so you wanted to reuse that and I think they agreed to that, right? And so they did that. So- I hope it, so, you know, I thought I mean, that would- fine. You know, and actually really, you know, you you discovered in Bodh Gaya, would be, of course you could, could have told on that story about how you rediscovered in Bodh Gaya and so on, but it comes back from Burma. So in other words, come, what's come back from Burma and Sri Lanka, it's not just a Sri Lankan thing, you know, it's an Indian thing, you know, which, uh, which um, of course, in India, what is happening now, actually, are, are the people all here yet, or what's going on? I don't know. Can you hear me okay? I hear uh, Bob is a little bit hard to hear. I don't know. If really? You can't hear? No, you, the sound is coming in clearly. We're just helping a couple of people with their personal okay. connections. Okay. Yeah, I'm well, having a little hard time hearing. The other people. Are there other okay. people there? No, they can hear okay. I'm meeting the chat. So, okay, uh, yeah, I don't see anybody but us. I don't see the other... No, no, we're only going to see each other. We're only going to see... Oh, it's that kind of a thing. Okay. Okay, well, I was just saying that... Um, that uh, So, in India, you know, they thought Buddhism was something from Sri Lanka, in other words, you know. But really, it, it went to Sri Lanka from India and went to Burma from India and so on, you know. And so, the Indians, it would be good for them to have Buddhism back as their own thing in the context of their major crisis at the moment, of course, is the Hinduism-Islam thing, you know, which is a little bit stressful because of the British splitting the country into the two parts, you know, and, that, and yet there were more Muslims still in regular India than in Pakistan. And, um, but never mind, we, we, we'll all get past all of that, I'm sure. <laughs> we will. So, and so your story, uh, dear Sharon, of discovering in Bodh Gaya, you know, uh, what's going, I guess it was, um, what was originally the, the person, it was um, not Goenka, it was another guy who was your first teacher there. Uh, Goenka was my first teacher there. Oh, he was your first teacher there, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, it was another one, I guess that's the one who kept asking Jack Engler about his uh, stomach. Um, Menindra? Yeah, Menindra, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that one too, that's a really nice one. How was your digestion? Yes. So, so um, are people, are they, do they have questions up for Sharon? Jane? Yeah, well, I think, I don't know how, you, Justin, uh, how do you want to do this? Do you want, 
me to choose questions? I think we can do that, whichever you two prefer. If you'd okay, like to now, read I am the getting, I'm getting feedback from people saying Bob's volume is lower than mine, so they increase the volume to hear him. <laughs> now it sounds like I'm oh, going. They, they, so. Really? They're not getting my thing? I'm, yeah, I'm having a hard time hearing Bob, so. You are? Yeah. Oh, really? It's, it's, it's better now that your mic is closer to your face. Okay. Well, I, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm rooting the mic through another thing, but... but um, Let's see. Okay, well, we're all, first of all, Mercury's okay. in retrograde. Second of all, Zoom is All time. right. Are you, do you still hear me okay? Yeah, we are fine. Okay. Okay, so, so, so uh, how about if I lead a short meditation? Sure. And then uh, just and to some and okay, distribute please. questions. Yeah, please. Because here we are. First of all, it's so delightful to see you, Bob, and... Uh, it would be delightful to see everyone else, but I can't see anyone else. I see Bob. And uh, it's always great to be together. And this is how we get together these days. So so this is a good thing all together. So why don't we sit together uh, for a few minutes. And as I've been saying, as I lead sittings, very often the thing I am focusing on is the quality of rest just having an object like the feeling of the breath or perhaps some other sensation in the body, something that's already happening and just resting attention on it, which will create a sense of spaciousness so that thoughts can come and go, feelings can come and go, images can come and go, and we're just resting. This also gives us the perspective to see what's coming and go, going more clearly. So you can place some tension wherever you feel the breath most predominantly, which will give us that kind of centering object. And as I am very fond of emphasizing, the really critical moment is the moment after we've gotten lost, we've gotten swept away in something, we've gotten reactive or we've fallen asleep. It's the moment where we have the chance to let go and bring our attention back to that centering object, to the feeling of the breath. So we let go without blame, without judgment, and we begin again. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes. 
or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. Uh, Justin, do you want me to start or do you want to um, distribute questions? I think it would be good for you to start, that you pick the questions. Okay. Well, I can't pick all the questions, but I'll pick the first one. That sounds um, good. Or maybe the first two. I'll combine some. Uh, so there's a question in the chat <clears throat> saying, Dr. Thurman talked about people getting addicted to calm, where you can't relate critically to reality. And I'd be curious um, if I've, they're asking me if, if I have seen this. And then there's a question in the Q&A box um, okay. about if I could please explain how one could use insight-based meditative techniques to integrate some of the ethical values espoused in this week's Global Vision Summit. So I want to put those two together uh, to say, yes, certainly uh, people can get addicted to calm. Um, partly because I think that when we practice concentration, which is really the gathering of our normally more scattered, fragmented attention and energy, and we bring that energy together, it opens the doors to some incredible states, you know, that could be available to us, but are not because we're throwing our energy all over the place. You know, they say we get consumed by kind of useless thinking about the past. I mean, there are useful ways of thinking about the past, but we can often get into a pattern that's not that useful where uh, we think about something where we now have some regret, but we're not thinking about it for lessons learned or for how to make amends. We're just going over it and over it and over it and over it. And, or usually and, and especially I'd say these days in our time, it's an and, we think about the future in a way that is just anxious. You know, what if this happens and that happens and that happens and that happens and that, you know, so we create a world that has not happened and may never happen, but we're filled with anxiety about it. And so it's like a huge um, loss of, of our attention, of our energy, and in concentration, we bring it together. So we feel uh, empowered because uh, that energy becomes available to us. We feel sometimes states of incredible calm and unification. It's like bringing our whole being together. So these are quite extraordinary states, but sort of the fundamental understanding is that um, if we get attached to anything that is by its very nature going to change, we're going to suffer. And that, uh, while meditation can do that, it can do so much more uh, in terms of uh, giving us a new way of relating not only to these sort of constructed and beautiful states, but to painful states, you know, so that uh, we don't feel so judgmental. We feel compassion and um, we don't feel so isolated. We recognize kind of our connection to others and um, we can see deeply into how changing everything is and how interconnected we all are so that we use the practice uh, not only for some greater peace or calm, but we use it for insight, for understanding, for wisdom. And that's really what it was designed for. So, uh, you know, it's in a way it's not surprising that people get addicted to calm because we don't have an awful lot of it in our lives sometimes. And it's like, wow. Uh, but if we get addicted to anything, if we, if we get attached to anything in that sense of holding on, we're going to suffer because we can't like make it so, you know, and it's not going to last. And so the wisdom is sort of more the point and, and the bringing of ethics and bringing of values into life, I think happens in two ways. Um, at least 
One is that we do get insight. We get insight into things uh, like interconnection. We, we genuinely see how our lives are, are interdependent, how they're intertwined. And so the ways we might behave recklessly or, <clears throat> you know, looking through somebody instead of looking at them and discounting them or objectifying them, it doesn't work so much when we have insight because um, we have a different worldview now. And uh, we also see, you know, the things we thought might, or maybe we weren't told, you know, by our families or whomever, you know, that um, the things that make you strong are things like vengefulness or something like that. And, but you actually look at that state when you're just paying attention to what you're feeling and you think, whoa, that's kind of brittle and contracted and lonely, isn't it? Or you look at a state like compassion, which maybe you were always taught was stupid and sentimental and you say, wow, look at the strength in that. So we find that for ourselves, you know, what makes us happy. And then the other way, which I think is really crucial and it's certainly been crucial for me is that if we're mindful, if we're aware, we can, um, be so in touch with what we're feeling <clears throat> and we can have a better relationship to what we're feeling so that we don't fall into every passing emotion and just act it out. But we also don't resent what we're feeling or try to push it away. So we have a more balanced relationship and then we have a choice. So my favorite definition of mindfulness for years was from this article in the New York Times about a pilot program bringing mindfulness into the classroom. And they asked one of the kids, this is a fourth grade classroom in Oakland. They asked one of the kids who's let's say nine or 10 years old, if he's in fourth grade, what is mindfulness? And he said, mindfulness means not hitting someone in the mouth. That's <laughs> what mindfulness means. And I thought that is a great definition of mindfulness. Because what does it imply? It implies you know you're feeling angry when you're starting to feel angry, not after you've sent the email, you know, but when it's just beginning. And it also implies a certain balanced relationship to the anger. Because if you just get overcome by it and um, defined by it, you'll probably hit a lot of people in the mouth because life can be really frustrating. But if on the other hand, you're embarrassed about what you feel and you're ashamed of it and you're trying to push it away and you're trying to deny it. You're just going to get tighter and tighter and tighter until you explode. So we say mindfulness is like that place in the middle where we're fully aware and connected to what's going on, but there's some space. And in that space, we have choice. So I like to think of that kid in that space thinking, you know what? Hit someone in the mouth last week. Didn't work out that well. Let me try this. And so that's how we take values that we might hold in a more abstract way and, and we bring them to life. Yes. That's really nice. I love that mindfulness is not hitting somebody. <laughs> I really like that. That's really outstanding. Totally outstanding. Well, you know, oh, gee, was my computer's about to crash. Hold on, I got to try. Okay, good. Justin, do you want me to go on or did you choose a question? No, 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 it's okay. I'm, I'm going to say one thing. I just okay. wanted to say about that question that uh, the only thing about the, uh, it's not mindfulness. Mindfulness is not going to addict you to calm because if you become more observant of what's going on in your mind, you'll realize it's very, it's very, um, there's a lot of action in the mind, a lot of distraction. You know, your mind keeps scattering and distracting around. But it's what if that had to do with the two kinds of categories of meditation in Theravada, Mahayana, all Buddhism. One is called shamatha, you know, peaceful uh, abiding, and the other one is called vipassana, which means analytic investigating or seeing analytically, critically. And so some people do first the one-pointedness, uh, but the, the general recommendation in Buddhism is to do the critical analysis of reality first, because the one-pointedness can lead someone into a space where they just kind of like 
cool themselves out and then they had too much trouble to have to think about what, what's the difference between reality and unreality. And in the Eightfold Path, for example, the first, the first uh, branch of the Eightfold Path is the realistic worldview where you correct you know, crazy ideas and you look at a realistic idea about cause and effect and whatever it is, you know. And then the samadhi, which is the one pointed thing, is the eighth of the branches, you know, and all sorts of ethical and mindful. And then mindfulness is the doorway opening to samadhi. So in a way, since mindfulness is looking very closely at the inner world and the realistic worldview is looking closely at your view of the world and what, uh, what your preconceptions are and all your adopted from the culture all your unthinking notions about what reality is and so forth uh, then uh, then by the time you come to samadhi where you're going to be one pointed you you already have an um, ethical and intellectual kind of correction and, a, and an open-minded attitude and uh, an open attitude not a fanatical one so you're not really going to get stuck in that case but if you just did samadhi uh, and the Buddha say, like, uh, every meditative tradition has one-pointedness of mind. And if you put one-pointedness of mind even into a, an unrealistic view, then you're going to become a fanatic adherent of that unrealistic view because you'll be one-pointed. So that's, the, that, that's why they, they, they evaluate those two categories of meditation in Buddhism in the way that they do. That was all. That was that, that's what that question had to do with. And uh, it was not mindfulness. It was a one-pointedness, you know. That is the, is the key, you know, to, it's where you could become a little bit like quietized, you know, <laughs> let's say. <laughs> okay, so uh, what, what else? So, you know. So, Justin, do you want me to go on or did you want to, did you choose some questions? Um, if you'd like to go on, I've got a couple questions I can lead with. Okay, if you'd why, like. don't you, why don't you start and then I'll fill in, Justin. That sounds good. Okay. So from Joel and Michelle Levy, given the dire circumstances of these times with regards to long-term effect of climate crisis, epidemics, fires, famine, and crop failures, the rise of fascism and social unrest, what are, the, what are your latest thoughts regarding the Shambhala prophecy? From what you have said in the past about the Shambhala warriors not arriving for some hundreds of years from now, that it seems like it might be too late. Sharon, Bob? Oh, it's not my tradition, so that's really up to Bob. So I'm you could hear from well, him too. The Shambhala thing, yes. Well, no, I think well, Shambhala will arrive on November 3rd, I think, with a landslide election. <laughs> then we'll be in Shambhala, as far as I'm concerned. So we don't have to wait 400 years for November 3rd, only about nine days, I think. So. But yeah, that what you're referring to, uh, Joel and Michelle, is this uh, prediction about a time when sort of Dharma is everywhere in the world. And actually, interestingly, not just Buddhist Dharma, uh, in, the, in the details of the Shambhala prophecy having to do with the Wheel of Time or the Kala Chakra um, uh, Tantra, uh, in the details of that, they say that at the time when the era of Shambhala dawns, which in their prediction is 425 years from now, after all these terrible wars that have been going on that are already World War I and II and then more are going on for another three centuries, three or four centuries, which is what I don't agree with that timing, but that's what's written in the text. And I used to argue with Tibetans about it who are into the text, and I'm saying, well, that's nice, but maybe there's different ways of interpreting the timing because the planet is not going to last at another three or four hundred years of world wars, carbon pollution, the oil industry dominating everything, et cetera, and bad agriculture, and it's not going to last. And uh, so that's my view of that, you know. But um, it's all as a Dalai Lama, he doesn't even agree with the Shambhala prophecy. He says he doesn't believe in it, he doesn't like living by prophecies. Uh, that he likes the Kala Chakra Yoga, the meditations of Kala Chakra, but the prophecy thing is not is not really of interest to him. And um, but uh, I, I I'm not quite that agnostic about it as he is, I, I, because I had a dream once where I met some Shambhala people, which was a lot of fun. Although I didn't get to talk to them because I have so much bad karma, but I got to hear them talking, and I realized who they were, and. Um, 
so I think it's there, there, there that the world will have the Shakyamuni Buddha, put it this way, um, his Buddha land, which is the way in the Mahayana, the Vimalakirti Sutra, you can see that this planet is the Buddha verse or Buddha field of Shakyamuni Buddha. And uh, he, Shakyamuni, had a kind of grand narrative. And the way it, go, it went was the, the extent that, that, that we know about is where he said he didn't want the Mahayana to spread for 400 years until the monastic traditions had become well rooted in Indian culture, which he, which were created by him really. And uh, or the kind of tradition, a lot of people, men and women actually, having free food, excused from household duties, lifelong, like a lifelong scholarship, basically excused from military service, excused from tax paying productive work, and just to be fed to get a free lunch every day from the lay community. To, get, to create an institution like that is not easy. So he didn't want some kind of confusions about non-dualism to make it hard for that institution to develop and become really strong and people to really embark upon the mendicant life, bhikshuni or bhikshu, uh, and it took, he realized it would take about 20 generations to really become fixed in the Indian culture, where even kings, even the greediest king who wanted all military and all service, and the greediest patriarchs who wanted all slavery of women, and didn't want any women going off and being bhikshunis, by no means, you know, but that they couldn't dare destroy that institution. And so he, wa he realized that would take a long time. So for example, that's a kind of uh, grand view of the change of the society that Buddha predicted, at least in, our, in my view, in the Mahayana view. And um, but the Kala Chakra then is a larger prediction that the Kali Yuga, sort of Brahminical idea of the world as deteriorating and getting worse and worse every generation, a very conservative type of idea. Um, fitted within that is um, the Maitreya story of another Buddha coming after, but after extreme Kali Yuga for another 50,000 years or something, really long time. So there is that, that Buddhist kind of critique of that indirectly. And then, but then the Shambhala one is a much quicker uh, critique in that it says 400 years from now, which is about 3,200 years after Buddha's time, uh, there will be a, um, uh, a renaissance on the planet with the, well, that will last for 1800 years of where Dharma will be everywhere in, all, in the form of all the other different religions. It's not in the form of only Buddhism. That's a very important point. That is actually in, this, in the Tantra. And, uh, but, and, but religious intolerance will be a thing of the past. You know, that one religion saying the other one is evil and we're going to convert everybody or kill them. The crusading type of attitude will not exist, but all the other religions, the love side, the positive side of all the religions will be there. And Dharma, that will be Dharma, meaning helping people free themselves from suffering through love and compassion and this kind of thing. So, so that's all I have to say on that topic. <laughs> on that topic. So um, there's another good one for Sharon here, I think. It says... Uh, uh, well, yeah, you already answered about being, uh, mindfulness means not to hit someone in the mouth. Right. Well, actually, I have some more. I have, I have one I'll answer, and then Go I'll, ahead, uh, yeah. I have one to ask you, Bob, from this listen list. Justin has uh, has some more right now. So, uh, Ivana Grace, who's in the third grade, wants to know about a good quote or mantra to suggest um, that I could suggest or we can suggest. Uh, to share with her classmates. So I'm going to turn this over to Bob in one second. So what I would say, besides don't hit anyone in the mouth, um, would be uh, the, things I kind, the things I say, the kinds of things I say myself are things like plant a seed of love. And then I imagine what that might look like. Maybe it's thanking somebody that I don't normally extend appreciation to, but I kind of take for granted. Or I listen to somebody who seems a little bit out of it, you know, maybe they have no one else to talk to so much or so just like plant a seed of love. And then uh, my fundamental mantra is like, take a breath, just take like a breath. Oh, take a breath, put the pause button on, you know, like Very good. before you respond, just like take a breath. So what would you say, Bob, to a group of eight year olds? 
Well, uh, this is, uh, uh, Gracie was in the third grade, you say? This Ivana Grace is in the third grade. I see. She's well, here tonight a listening mantra, to us. A good mantra would be, for the third grade, would be um, something like, um, I, I see you. I see you. You see me. I see you. You see me. I think maybe he hasn't, he or she hasn't seen, I couldn't hear the first name, he or she hasn't seen the, the uh, Avatar movie, but there's a wonderful thing of the, of the Indians in that movie, where when the Indians meet each other, they say to each other when they first meet, instead of hello, they say, I see you. And the other one says back, I see you. And so I think a nice one would be if you, when you see your friend or when, when another person annoys you or something or when someone is, you're puzzled about someone, you think in your mind and you keep repeating, I see you, you see me, I see you. And the sense of by seeing you, you mean sort of I see where you're coming from. I realize that you're there as well as me. And of course, I'm here as well as you. So I see you, you see me, I see you, you see me, I see you, you see me, I see you. I think that would be kind of nice. There's lots of mantras, you know, like Om, that's a good one too. Everybody loves that one. Om, you just go Om, if you want to be sort of calm. If, it's not, if, if it doesn't involve interacting with someone else, you might also try the, the really age old one that everybody likes, which is just, Om, just like O M, Om, like home but without an H, Om, 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 and that's that's a really nice one. That that makes you feel calm and peaceful. It's very ancient. It's sort of like in church, people go Amen, or in synagogue, I think they say something like that, Amen. They have a prayer word like that. So it's very similar, but it's, it's from India. It's a great, nice thing from India. Om. You can just go Om. How's that? How's that? Is Sounds that good? good to me. <laughs> so I'm, actually, I want to direct a question to you. Uh, I'm waiting for uh, to hear what Justin says. Somebody says, I, want, I would love to hear about the concept of a good birth. What exactly is this process? Is it achievable for someone like myself who's made many mistakes in this incarnation? Yeah. So you can made you many what a good birth means and oh, good if birth, birth. If we've made a lot of mistakes, yeah, in our lives, can we still have a good birth? Sure. Well, the point is you, you, that you're here and you're with us, and you're interested in these things means you definitely have a good birth now. And uh, one of the great things about the birth was that you were able to make a lot of mistakes, <laughs> and now you're seeking to learn from them. And, uh, you know, if you learn, you, you, know, you have to make mistakes to learn how not to make mistakes. And so if you learn from the mistakes, then that means in the next birth will be better because you won't have to make the same mistakes. You know, there's a, there's a version, not the Tibetan one, but there's another version of the, of the between state and the Bardo state, the between state in the next life, is that you, you get reborn in such a way where you have to go and redo things better that you didn't do so well previously. There's a version like that. So you have to try, you know, you keep trying until you get there, you know. And there's like, a, you know, you have a kind of natural way like that, that people say like that. It's not the Tibetan thing, that's a Western thing. But I think that's a really nice thing. So the point is, everyone has made a lot of mistakes. I certainly make a lot of mistakes. I still am making mistakes. And uh, I, but I try to learn from them. And uh, that's, why, that's why we're so lucky we have the kind of human mind that can be self-aware and we can notice when we blow it. And actually mindfulness practice is the biggest mistake practice there ever was because you're trying to count your breath and Sharon is the one who taught me about how the great thing in mindfulness is not when you can count to 10 without a flaw, maybe rushing a little bit like one, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, ten, so you can't get distracted. But when you do get distracted at three, and then you notice you got distracted and you pull your mind back. And that self-correction is the biggest thing that happens to you. And uh, I think, you know, 
at least if you're a beginner like me, I think, that, I mean, I, maybe I'm not saying the right things, Mishar, so please say it, correct me, please. If you no, see. I think that's great. Is that good? So, I think so you know, mistaking and trying and again, and mistaking and correcting and trying again, that's the greatest thing. That's the greatest thing. How is my volume, by the way? Is it okay? Can you hear okay? Still not good? You're sounding great. It's great? It's sounding very good, nice and clear. Oh, yeah, good, okay. We have a question so, from an old know. friend, Pierre, um, who was the old webmaster for Tibet House. He says, nowadays I am working 18 hours a day on a new startup in the health tech field I launched recently. Any advice on maintaining focus, driving message, and achieving goals? Someone's working 18 hours a day? I, I don't get the question. Justin, I think you're going to have to repeat that. Yeah, it's from Pierre. Pierre asks, um, he's working a, a tech startup, and he wants advice on maintaining focus, driving his message, and achieving the goals of his startup. Right. Well, what do you think, Sharon? How about trying 12 hours a day? <laughs> <laughs> and then sleeping for six. You know? Well, my whole yeah, sleeping is a good idea. <laughs> no, I, I really do. Um, I think that one of the things I'm uh, noticing myself lately in myself in terms of language is that I, I, uh, try not to get caught up in things like maintain keep stay because i'm so into um this idea of beginning again you know like i see people so discouraged so much of the time because i think or people ask like uh how do i stay mindful all day long or how do i keep concentration going all day long and i said you're not going to Right. You know, like we all lose it, we fall down, uh, we get reactive, you know, but we can start over again sooner and sooner and sooner and more gracefully and with more compassion for ourselves and uh, certainly more quickly. And, and so uh, I, I think that's really the aspiration in a way. It's like, how can I have a certain set of values that are my North star that I'm trying to guide my day by? And that might include some balance actually. And uh, even in a startup and um, how do I really learn resilience? Because it's going to be essential. There's no, I used to think just in terms of meditation practice that maybe I would have a struggle for a while, but then I'd have the great breakthrough experience and everything would just be soaring after that. And it's just not like that. You know, we're always needing to begin again and again and again. So I would just kind of reframe the day like that and, and uh, be able to forgive yourself, you know, for the times when you feel overwhelmed because it sounds overwhelming. And then I would say Bob's suggestion is not so bad to get some sleep. No, it's true because like when I was, um, you know, when I was in the hospital a while ago when I was sick and then I was better, I am better by the way, but you know, when I was, the first time I got up to walk, um, as when I was using a walker in the hospital and I had a physical therapist with me and I was walking up and down the hospital corridors as one does. And, and at one point the physical therapist said to me, it's not a race, you know. You're going to get further if you just let yourself stop now and then and like take a break. <laughs> and that became, that became my mantra. It's not a race, you know? Yeah. Like, and I think that's something, even when you feel urgency, you feel, you know, intensity of purpose and things like that. Uh, it's still not a race. You're not going to get more done because you're, you know, you're falling into that kind of crazed tempo. So allow yourself to take some breaks. Right, Pierre, Pierre Bourg, I just found your question. And I see, I see you used to be a webmaster at Tibet House, so thank you very much for that. And, uh, and I just, uh, I really do think though that 18 hours a day on a new startup, if, if it really needs you to work 18 hours a day, then I think you might question 
uh, and people who are funding it or helping you with it might question the value of it. In other words, you should take you should take a break. And it made me think of a talk I once attended. A friend of mine, who was in Jerry Brown's government in the 1970s, uh, where his first time as the governor of Mass of um, California, and at that time there were all these Zen people joining the, the administration and everything, and he said very tellingly that they all came in with high hopes, and they ended up not really getting that much that they really wanted done when they collided with reality. And they put in like these huge days, but one of the main reasons is that the way the job was structured, they had to they had to be so much on the phone and so much there all the time and so much stress that within a very short time, the quality of the judgments that people made got worse and worse, and they started getting you know falling into routine patterns and making bad decisions and you know it really in other words one should structure the, the amount of work it takes to get the startup going in such a way that you can, you can maintain, in other words, the maintaining focus, driving message and achieving goal should be, first of all, and they probably will be, be precluded if you have to do too many 18 hour days, you and others, because then you're gonna frazzle out and then you won't achieve, then those goals will not be met. So there is an issue of going back to the supporters, restructuring the whole thing, what are the deadlines and why such a super deadline, et cetera. And, you know, and because, because without maintaining focus on having the real message, your original ideal and your vision, and you're achieving your goal, then you, you will just break down if you keep going 18 hours a day, if, you're in, if, you, if it's badly structured like that. So I would say that would be, that would be more, more detail. But anyway, good luck. You can certainly pull a few 18 hour days here and there for, for in some crisis, but long period of term, you can't produce really great stuff when, you, when you're in such a stressed situation because the quality of your judgment decreases as you, as you get more and more fatigued and, and uh, frazzled, you know, <clears throat> right? I mean, you know, even the only way you could possibly do it is to become a Buddha and work 24 hours a day by being asleep and awake at the same time. <laughs> so, Bob, I'll ask you so a question. You, I'll, I'll ask you a question on behalf of someone else. Um, <laughs> Evan, who posted the question twice. Uh, if you're a novice practitioner and it's just overwhelming, there's so many teachers, there's so many paths of study, there's so many schools of Buddhism and you feel very drawn to Buddhism, but you get discouraged by just the uh, the amount of schools of thoughts and vehicles. It's like, how do you start and how do you like find a path? Yeah. Well, is that for me? No, that's for you. Sure. No, I'm going to ask if you, I'm going to ask you. Well, well, the first thing is, you know, don't be drawn to Buddhism. I don't know what is your birth, what is your grandmother's religion? The Dalai Lama first thing would say, that you should, you should remain connected to and respectful of grandma's religion as far as looking for religion. And then Buddhism has a lot of services, things that can help you, but they shouldn't be things that you feel are impossible to use, then they're not, oh, they're not services, they're like some kind of challenges or something. And so mindfulness, you know, you can do mindfulness as a Jewish or Christian or secularist or whatever, and a lot of the people who do it are that. And that will help you develop better understanding of how your mind works and will help you to not to react immediately to things and will improve your immediate situation. And uh, so it won't be a strain for you to work with it, you know. And so you should break down what you're considering to be quote unquote Buddhism into the various services and paths that are offered, some sort of intellectual reasoning processes, some meditative processes, some ethical processes, and pick things that will enhance what you're doing and what you need to do, or sometimes maybe critique something that you do and make you do it a little differently. It'll get to be like that too. But the point is, just take whatever's useful and don't think that there's some big thing, Buddhism, that you have to sort of take on board or it is some weird, weird exotic ship that is about to take off for outer space and will you get on it or not get on it? <laughs> what do you have to leave behind? In other words, that, that's not a useful way to go about it. So, so I think the ism business is a real problem 
And one, one thing everybody should remember is that when Buddha attained enlightenment, awakening enlightenment, under his tree, and then after some weeks he went out to, to teach people what he thought might be of help to them, there was no such thing as Buddhism for them to join. And rather he said, well, what, what are you, how are you using your life and what are you doing with it? And do, would you like it to be meaningful? And would you like to be not suffering? Would you like to be suffering less? And I have some, some, some therapies for you you can work with to help you in that, in that uh, direction. And then they took that. They, did, they weren't confronted by Buddhism. They, they saw a guy who said he was a Buddha. Sometimes, sometimes he would say some upsetting things like there's no such thing as a Buddha. <laughs> Occasionally, he would say that just to shock them, uh, but uh, but uh, you know he, he was just offering help to them. And so, whatever you are thinking is Buddhism, and however it presents itself to you, you should see what seems helpful and to make use of it if it's useful, and reject it if it isn't. You know, but the, you, nobody's saying you need to be Buddhist or something. That's not. That, you know, in the old days, people might have done that. And people who love Buddhism, as I do, I might have, like, not in an academic setting, but in a general setting, like 30 years ago, I might have said, oh, yeah, Buddhism is great. It's all the Buddhism. But I, I finally, Dalai Lama persuaded me that it's better that people stick with wherever they are, and then they use things from other traditions if they're useful. And I actually think, after years of study, that the Buddhist sciences are the most useful thing. And their, their meditative skills and the wonderful meditative services that they help you learn to do, for example, at Barry, at Sharon's wonderful institution, um, those are based on the science of the mind and understanding how it works and how, how to help other people learn in their own experience how it works. And so they can use their mind better. That really, it's like an educational thing. And it's really, really had a big impact on a lot of people and been very, very helpful. And a lot of them have not necessarily become Buddhists, you know. And uh, they, they, or, or there's a new thing. You could be a Jew Boo or a Chris Boo or a Mu Boo or uh, an, I don't know what you'd call an atheist Buddhist, maybe an Ath Boo. <laughs> it's sort of a few lists, but go Ath Boo. <laughs> That's not very good. Sek Boo, maybe Secular Boo, Secular, Secular Boo. So there's these combinations, and those are all good. They're all good. So we're not competing with, with, uh, with those kind of things. You know, we're just offering the services that have been of age-old benefit to millions and billions of people over the centuries. That's beautiful. I would also add, you know, you can take, like, the really essential teaching, like the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, and and know that that's that's what you're going to apply in your meditative practice you know and then you can look at it it's kind of exciting too you know uh, it's a different way of study you know just say well what do they say about the four noble truths in this school and that school and understand you may get a different metaphys metaphysics or um elaboration but essentially it's going to be the same and that's the whole point right Sherry, can I share with you one of my latest things? This is Saturday Night Live, so it's a little bit humorous. But I have a new name for the Four Noble Truths in English, calling them the Four Friendly Facts. Oh, that's very, that's very different. <laughs> <laughs> because if you say that, you know, because the Noble Truths, they, they're, I mean, it's so Satya, you can translate as truth, oh. of course. Uh, but but uh, also Satya can be a fact or a reality also. And, uh, and then to change noble to friendly, because what noble means is a person who cognitively, even for Buddha, what it meant was not someone born in the upper classes, but someone who cognitively has become more noble in the nice meaning of the word, meaning more, more empathetic and more altruistic. So therefore they feel, they really see things from the other person's point of view. They feel the other person's presence in a different way. And that made them noble with noblesse oblige, right? So he called it noble. He used the word that was used as a class word in India at the time. But in a way, a friend is someone who puts, him, puts herself or himself in your shoes to see how you see things and therefore takes your perspective very much into consideration. That's what a good friend does. So in a way, friendly facts. So <laughs> Buddha taught them to people because he was friendly with them. And he said, why are you suffering? You said, oh, gee whiz, I, here's why. 
And then if you want, and then I think you can get free of that suffering. That's the third noble truth in prognosis. And then here's a method how you, I, unfortunately, just by me saying that, just by saying there is a good prognosis, that doesn't help right away, except it can aim you a certain way. But then the path is your therapy. And uh, so it's really, this, the, in, in Indian medicine, the Four Noble Truths, Four Friendly Facts, are, are a medical diagnosis, really, rather than a bunch of religious propositions, is what I'm trying to say, you know? And, 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 and uh, the Evan or whoever asked that question, they can see it like that. It's like, it's a prescription, basically. So when you go to a doctor and get a prescription, you don't say, well, I'm going to become a convert to medicine, but you think about, am I going to use this particular prescription for this particular symptom to cure this particular disease? That's, that's sort of more like where, how you take it on board, let's say. Right, but isn't that fun, Jared? You're like, that's my friend. I do that, it's, it's so oh, different. Friendly facts. Like, friendly facts. Like, Kalyana Mitra, you know, good friend, you know. So facts from a good friend, you know. And the first is suffering. <laughs> That's supposed to be humorous, guys. I hope people are laughing. <laughs> so, uh, Justin, okay. do you want to? What else? Yeah, for the next one, um, from Mona. Um, she has a question about the role of bare attention and dropping through the storyline and the role of delving into the content, i.e. psychotherapy and other content exploring healing methods. I think she wants to learn more about bare attention and examining the storyline. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Actually, I'm going to uh, maybe combine that with a couple of other questions that I glanced at. One about emotional regulation and one about the grief and sadness and fear of our time. Uh, and then, you know, I'll, I'll say something and I'm eager to hear what Bob might say. And, and so, um, you know, in the, like in the Burmese school of practice in which I, I first began, um, there might be several different approaches, uh, say, to working with what we call emotional regulation now or um, having a different relationship to our emotional landscape, you know, and um, especially when we're talking about things that are painful, you know, grief, anger, which is a very painful emotion when we're lost in it, fear, and so on. So one is the, the perspective of mindfulness, which is a whole set of tools that train, helps us be aware of what's happening in the moment without adding on the things that we usually add on in a kind of proliferating proliferation like if something hurts right now we might immediately project it into the future like what's it gonna feel like tomorrow what's it gonna feel like next week what's it gonna feel like next year so we have all of that anticipation on top of what is actually happening or this tremendous sense of isolation rather than realizing this is a part of the human condition this this sort of suffering or vulnerability should help us find one another and care for one another more we feel like we're the only ones and, and we reify it and we identify with the state. This is who I really am. Nothing else matters. This is permanent and so on. There are lots of stuff just from the force of habit that we tend to add on what, to what is already hurting to begin with. And so um, there are different steps in the process of mindfulness. One is, uh, first of all, to pivot our attention when we have a strong emotion going on. It usually involves a story or a, a circumstance and we get entranced by that circumstance. It's like even when you have say, tremendous desire for let's say a new car, which is not a good New York example, but you're not all in New York. So let's say you have tremendous desire for a new car. What do we do? We think, should I do this kind of feature or that kind of feature or that upholstery? We don't usually turn our attention around and say, what does it feel like to want something so badly? But that's what we do in the mindfulness process. You know, not what are we angry at and what are we going to do about it, but what is anger? What is it? What's its nature? So first we pay attention in the body. This is like the bare attention part. Um, 
and we see if those add-ons arise, what's it going to feel like tomorrow? This is really me. See if we can relinquish those so that we're just with the experience as it is. And that allows us to develop insight. So uh, let's say it's anger. We may see many feelings within it. We may see fear. We may see sadness. We certainly may see a sense of helplessness in there. And we understand this is a complex feeling. It's also not solid. It's coming and going and changing and, and moving. And so we have a different handle on relating to the anger because of that insight. Um, and that would be the approach of mindfulness. Uh, the, there's another approach. Well, let me go back to the mindfulness approach for a second. So that gives us a kind of emotional regulation, both because uh, we're in that place in the middle. Remember, we're not hitting people in the mouth. We're not falling into <laughs> being defined by the emotion. We're also not repressing it and disliking it. We're, we're just kind of there in an open way. So that gives us a, a whole other way of handling it. And then we have insight into it. If we're going to take action and we see the sadness and the anger, and we see especially the helplessness and the anger, then we have a way of acting that is more comprehensive. It's just more intelligent uh, because of that. So this whole other approach based on something like loving kindness would be to realize that um, we can fall into ruts of attention and just be uh, enslaved by habit a lot. And that we can actually shift, or I call it stretch, the stretch. We can stretch the way we pay attention. We can experiment. We can look at ourselves from different angles. We can look at our feelings from different angles. We look at others from different angles. Um, and we kind of almost play, we experiment, uh, not in a way that's moving us into hypocrisy or phoniness, but usually into something that gets very little airtime. So one example would be a gratitude practice to write down three things a night that we feel grateful for from the day. Um, just to remember there's good in the world also, you know, there's, uh, there's not only these, these terrible things and what's going on, and it's not to deny the pain, which would be really silly, but uh, it's to expand our view and actually get more realistic because we're seeing many sides of things at the same time. And so, like, that's a, now getting to be a pretty common exercise write down three things a day and though somebody said to me not too long ago they said i'm going to look for one thing a month that i can be grateful for and i said i think we can do more than that you know like because if you're breathing that's like good you know and 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 loving kindness is extrapolating that or looking for the good and my favorite story from this terrible time and uh i of course know a lot of the other stories as well is um, of this school in Minneapolis, which uh, after there were riots and there was looting and, and different stores were burnt down and people had some trouble getting food, uh, they became kind of a food uh, bank basically for the community. And they put out a call for I think it was 80 or 85 bags of food that they needed to feed these families. And they got 20,000. Mm. That's, that's literally the chart. I can't remember if it was 80 or 85, but I know it was 20,000. <laughs> and I think about that, you know, like in the midst of what we can see clearly is cruelty and selfishness and all kinds of things. Like this is also true. And so kind of that purposeful movement of your attention, it's not bare attention, which is more the mindful approach, uh, but it's another approach and we do both where we look for the good or we do loving kindness or we practice generosity ourselves, which will return us to some sense of inner abundance or inner completion. And uh, these things are very important as well. That's lovely. That's so lovely, Sharon.
How do you think we cope, Bob, with all this grief and sadness and fear? Cope with it. Well, and vote. <laughs> well, you're inspiring me, Cheryl, because you're coping so nicely. And I just want to say you, you look so happy and peaceful tonight. It makes me feel more peaceful. <laughs> it's really very, very nice. You do. You look radiant and peaceful. And uh, that is really peaceful to me. And what, well, what I'm thinking about in coping is that, you know, uh, after all, mindfulness is the literal translation of the word that we translate as mindfulness is actually remembering or memory. And I think one of the things that we can do to cope with difficulties is develop a better, uh, more, real, more realistic approach to those difficulties. One of, because one of our problems is that our memory is usually distracting us from what we are doing and where we are. You know, we walk around in a hypno hypnagogic state, really, pretty much, I think. It's one of the reasons why they use that word, I think, so brilliantly in the tradition. In the sense that we are kind of walking around doing this and that, but our mind is actually in a dream state of remembering something yesterday that was so irritating or annoying or some trauma 20 years ago or some terrible thing or worrying anxiously about the bad government or whatever it is. And so our, our memory is actually, uh, you know, either practically remembering the future or remembering our anticipations of the future and or dwelling on some problems in the past, which is then making us import all of that into this time without realizing it because we're sort of driving the car or doing something without really paying attention to what we're doing and our and our mind is off in some other world of uh, memory just distracted lost memory so mind why we call it mindfulness so then you take that memory and you remember that you're here doing something now and you remember that you're looking at how your mind is working now and you kind of control the sort of habitual wanderings of it that leave you ill-equipped to deal with whatever you have to deal with. So that you know, you're not even thinking about well, what am I really worried about? What really is the problem now? You know, because we're we're groaning about something yesterday, we're feeling bitter about some other thing, we're feeling anticipating some terrible problem in the future, etc. So so I think it, it's a kind of unifying the mind to be more on top of life, actually. Really, you know, I, 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 I'm really a lot in the Pali literature nowadays, uh, uh, Sharon, in the, in the um, you know, the Diga Nikaya, especially, I really love so many things in that. And, I, and I'm reading them and some of it's like I see it for the first time. It's so amazing, some of the things and the stories and the way the Buddha handles this and that situation. And, and one, there's one of them that I was reading where he keeps saying, this will help you right now, and then for the long run, it'll help you. This will help you. The Dharma helps you right now, and in the long run, it will help you. And what he means by the Dharma is a kind of teaching about what is really going on right this minute, you know. Like, for example, someone who's very depressed, who is, let's say, someone who gets very sad and depressed about something. But they are a human being, and they, maybe they're here with us tonight. And they're, therefore, they have time on there. They have leisure. They have a computer. They can come on and hang out with us for a little while on Saturday night. And instead of watching, I don't know, some terrible war movie or something, and they, and, or CNN and all the, the, the war. But they, instead of that, they're here thinking about it. But then they're not grateful for all of those things that they have able to do. They're able to sit here and be depressed, actually. <laughs> they have time to be depressed. I mean, the point is, there's so many silver linings in life, you know. And even, you know, my favorite thing, what I always sneak in, I, I sneak into when I do my one through 10 mindfulness breath meditation, beginning mindfulness practice, I always sneak in that with each breath, I am expressing gratitude, active gratitude to the plants, to the flowers, to the ferns, to the trees, to the bushes, because those plants are created that oxygen for me and they are ready to swallow up my carbon exhalation and feed me back more oxygen. And so we can be immensely grateful to all the greenery around us. You know? It's so amazing that we, 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 we're, we're so blessed that we live in a place where they, 
weird things grow up out of the ground to feed us oxygen so we can do breathing meditation. <laughs> it's totally fabulous. Imagine if we lived in a, some rock pile somewhere where there were no plants, then, then you know, it would really be, it'd be, where would the oxygen come from? I don't know. We'd have to make a machine to draw it out of the water or something. I don't know. H2O. Get like one little bar oxygen molecule, and I don't know what would happen to the hydrogen if we took it away from the water. So, so you know, it's uh, mindfulness means bringing your memory into now and looking at really what's happening in your in yourself and being more real about yourself and looking for what finding out what you are, and you might find out it it won't be one simple thing; it will be an amazing process that you actually really are, rather than the real you being some fixed thing. And by the way, there's a wonderful book that I discovered recently. I forgot the author, but it's called Real Change. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, recently released, and uh, we, we did a thing about it a while back with Sharon. Oh, Sharon, that's your book. That's right. Real oh, yeah. <laughs> really a good book. And how to deal with these changes, you know. Someone else is grumbling about worrying about the election and just breathing. Well, I agree, but there's no. But you can also just breathe and also worry about the good outcome in the election. That's for sure. And uh, we, it's possible to do chew and what is it? Chew and what is it? Chew gum and and walk at the same time. <laughs> there's different things like that. I think someone told me that there. Oh, Eric told me that the other day. He said you can chew and chew gum and walk, walk on the road at the same time. So, so that's great. And what are we doing here now? Knowing, what are your deep longings? Knowing who you are. You know, thinking about deep desires, longing. This is a great question by Mona Chopra. I like that. And are you related to Deepak? Well, I don't know. I just, Deepak did a really great talk in the Dalai Lama Global thing. Sharon, she oh, yeah. really did a, he did a really sweet talk in the World Religion Day, you know, which was today, actually. He really did a nice talk. We got science into it, of course, but it was really, really, really wonderful. I really enjoyed it. And um, he seems to be truly touched uh, by things. And he's, he's, lost, he's doing a lot of yoga, and he's, he seems to be having a nice period, actually, Deepak. Very cheerful and happy. And he has a new book himself which he had a stack of next to him called Total Meditation. <laughs> I love that. But that is good. Total meditation is good. We should all be meditating all the time, of course. So this thing about the deep thing, you know, the thing is, in the context of the Buddhist tradition, you, Mona, have had many, many previous lives. In fact, we're all, there's no such thing as an old soul because we've all been beginningless. So we're all equally and infinitely ancient, every single one of us. And maybe what they mean by an old soul is someone who fairly recently has had a few human lives rather than animal or deity or demon or, or suffering being. You know, someone who's been close to the human form for some time. I think that's maybe what people are thinking about old soul. But the point is, we have drives in life that because of affinities of things we've done in previous lives. For example, Sharon was sitting in a classroom in Buffalo, and she was not that, that cheered up about the circumstances around for various reasons, but she was bravely there in that college classroom. And then somebody mentioned something about the Dharma or meditating or India or Buddha. I, I'm not sure she, she'll have to tell us if she feels like it, but she wrote it in a book so you can read it. And then boom, she was off there. And because it clicked something from her previous affinity, you know, because she, what she really wanted to know was what was it all about and what, what, what was real. And she wanted people to stop dancing around the real problems in life and acting like they weren't really there and that by living in denial, they would somehow go away. And she thought it was better to face them. And so she just was thrilled by the first noble truth of suffering. She thought that was great, that that'd be a friendly fact, that, hey, it's all right to suffer because that's what we do when we don't understand everything, you know. Luckily, it goes along with the third friendly fact that if we pay attention and really become aware of what it is that we're doing, we'll discover that we're, we can be free of suffering also if we know reality.
but uh, but that's the second step, you know. He wouldn't have said the first one if if there wasn't if there wasn't a way to get free of it, you know. So, but uh, so Sharon, so and that's because she had an affinity from previous lives. You know, I don't believe that that Sharon Salzberg to be when she was whatever, whoever, and whatever she has been in previous, recent previous lives, was not a big, great yogi or yogini. I'm sure she was. I have no doubt. And so, boom, they all back to that, you know. I can see that. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people maybe who have had previous affinity, they sometimes have a few difficulties in their youth. And maybe they choose to do that because they realize that it takes a few difficulties to make you want to wake up when you're still young enough to really do it instead of freaking out when you're 50 already and you're sort of stuck in your ways, you know, having a midlife crisis freak out. Although it's never too late to do that. So listening to the call of the soul. Now, the Buddhists might have a problem with the word soul. Many would, but that's wrong. Buddhists have souls, of course, but, we have, but it's just not a, it's not a barcode assigned from a filing cabinet in heaven you know, like, like, or like a genetic code, boom, that's a fixated thing. That it's not a soul like that. It's a super subtle process that called Chitta Santana in Theravada, meaning continuum of the mind in another life, you know. But that's the thing that goes from life to life. You don't take your body with you, you don't take your brain with you, you don't take your heart with you, but you take a very subtle sort of like a gene, a genetic thing about how you live, which itself changes, of course, all the time. And if you've lived well and been generous and open-minded and happy, then, then that one will seek that kind of a life and you'll have a happy life. So that's really cool. So, so the deep longings, everybody has a deep longing to be happy and to be free. And, um, you know, Mona Chopra, you come from this wonderful culture of India. So Fred, what, maybe some generations back, who knows? But the point is there, they did discover this thing about true freedom long, long time ago thanks to Buddha and his colleagues you know, 2,500 years ago. Moksha, you know. That not every culture has a moksha idea, really. But it's a great one. It really is great. So anyway, so, so Sharon, what about, what about emptiness? You have emptiness in Theravada. Can you tell us something about it, Sharon? What about emptiness? <laughs> yeah, well. Uh... What is emptiness? What is emptiness? Well, emptiness of self, which is the that's it, the place where it starts. You know, it, it's uh, um, you know, it, it often is portrayed. And, and I, when I first went to India after Buffalo, uh, or straight from Buffalo, I I had um, a lot of fear because the way I I, uh, I languaged my idea of the spiritual path is that we we're going to kill the ego. That we we're going like to what? Yeah. My idea was that that our goal was to kill the ego. Oh yeah, right, or, right. Or to annihilate the self, yeah. you know, and and that was terrifying to me. And and uh, it was very reassuring to me in first going a little bit more deeply into Buddhist teaching to see that they're not talking about that at all. They're talking about um, seeing clearly more how things actually are. That. Uh, the way we hold our idea of who we are um, or the self is it something solid and independent and in control. And uh, but when we really look, you know, everything is interdependent. Nothing is independent and, right. and congealed and separate and permanent. Yeah. And, you know, so it's actually ignorance that we're trying to challenge, not the self which has been like this companion showing us a good time that we're now going to kill uh you know so that was like a huge relief and for all the times i think the f most frequent question ever asked us uh starts with well if there's no self like if there's no self how am i gonna get out of this room and then we say, well, if you got into the room, you can get out of the room because <laughs> it's not like there was a self and you're getting rid of it. The idea is that the way we held it, the way we believed it to be was never true. Right. And talk about friendly facts. You know, the, uh, the word I really picked up from you, Bob, that you used a lot was realistic, 
which I used to think was not that exciting a word. And then I thought it was the most exciting word of all. Isn't it great? You know, to be realistic, because it means being aligned with the truth. Otherwise, where it's like proverbial banging your head against the wall, it's, it's being some weird relationship to the truth. And so um, the other way of seeing no self is not some, or another way of seeing emptiness is not so much uh, only about oneself and the idea of self, but really about just the nature of things that mm -hmm. the other side of that is interconnection. Cause it's not like a glimpse of emptiness means everything melts away, you know, and it's like this great blob things are as they are and everything arises and, and we have a world and we have a universe and uh, we have relationship and, and all of that, but uh, can that be and yet have no, no substantiality, no, no permanence, no, no concreteness. Uh, yes. And, and that's why there are all those beautiful image images used in Buddhist teaching of like, life is like a rainbow, like an echo, like a dream, like a, mm -hmm. um, and it is, isn't it? I, mean, I just came back from New York city today. Uh, I went to see my apartment and my doctor and, and I had not been there in seven months. Oh wow! You went to see today. Oh my god! I went. I just got back today. Yeah, and wow. and it was like, what a dream! I walked into this apartment that I left in mid March. I left in mid March because I had just gotten back there, and it felt really bad to me. And and you know, nobody quite knew what was dangerous and what wasn't. And no. Um, and so I came up here to Massachusetts with my snow boots, thinking I'd be here for two weeks. I was here for seven months. We sort of did that. They, you know, they, I just saw a figure the other day: four hundred and twenty thousand people moved out of New York. Wow! In, in March and in, in late February, March, April. Uh, for, you know, I mean, not permanently necessarily. They may have left empty apartments and things, but they went out of the town, found a place upstate or in Massachusetts or somewhere else, and uh, over four hundred, almost half a million people, so it took off out of the city at that time. And uh, hopefully that that won't happen again next. Year. We're yeah. Finally get it. I'm uh, I'm um, very um, sad with the media. They keep talking about they they've fallen into this distraction of uh, vaccination, whereas really we, what we need to do is what they did in Taiwan, where they actually had fed the government, the national government, created massive testing equipment and chemistry and labs so that everybody could be tested really fast and get a fast answer all the time, everyone, every day if necessary. And then fantastic computer digital contact tracing. And that's what they kept. They only had 12 people die out of 30 million, right? And they had and, and almost hardly anything. And, but without, there's no vaccination there. So that's what, but the vaccination is a fake thing that, oh, well, we're having all this trouble because we don't have a vaccine. But that's a typical distracting strategy by some people who fail to produce the actual real thing that you can do to control a virus, a pandemic, and which they didn't do, which they failed to do. So the media doesn't ever mention that when they bring up vaccination, then it's all, that, oh, vaccination next year, this year, when is vaccination? It's not that, it's testing right now. We don't have it. I, I've never had a test. I've never had one. I've been just here, so I haven't needed it. But but people should be, and it would, if, if I went, it would be difficult to have to go to Kingston, if it, I know what, you know. It wouldn't happen, wouldn't get an answer for six days and you could be, you could be like infected again since then. So I just locked myself up. You know? But anyway, we, you know, it, there is this uh, terrible silver lining though that it has showed us today. Uh, Alberto Villoldo gave a wonderful talk uh, on the Dalai Lama global thing from a shamanic point of view, from an indigenous tradition point of view, you know, really quite wonderful. It, they, you know, they, we always must include indigenous traditions with world religious traditions, we really should. And uh, he was saying that this, this virus is just a it's, a, it's an alert from the animals who are in the middle of the sixth great extinction, which is great, bigger than since that meteorite supposedly killed all the dinosaurs. It's like the worst thing that, and we have done this ourselves, it's not a meteorite, it's us. It's our out of control lifestyle that has done this. 
And so, you know, it's been a terrible wake up call with much suffering on the part of many people, but, and it's not over, but, uh, but uh, you know, the, there's the fires in the West Coast. Don't you love to visit California? I do, we're East Coasters, but we love going out there, but they are really burning and it's just beginning, that's just beginning. And they have these things called these tornadoes, fire tornadoes, they go up 30,000 feet into the air. They pick up 25 ton bulldozers and throw them around. They uproot giant trees and they burn them while flying around in the middle of this fire. And this is just beginning, you know, in, in it'll go right up to British Columbia, according to the scientists, because Pacific currents are not producing the rain along that coast, all the way from Mexico, Central America to, to British Columbia. It's going to be, it's really, you know, so the pandemic is just setting us to wake up a little bit and we realize we really have to make some serious, you know, we, there's nothing about, oh yeah, we'll get around to it. Oh, we have to, we have to do it gradually. Oh yeah, next year. Oh yeah, in 2050, we'll be ready to go. We, that's unacceptable. That is utterly unacceptable. It has to be really starting now, you know, being a real, we're living more realistically, basically. And, uh, and the, the mindfulness and meditative part of that is so important. Really, I think how many, if you would calculate, Sharon, I think the, the mission of Barry, Mindfulness Meditation Center, or, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, its name is, but how many thousands of people have developed some kind of inner awareness coming there for the last 40, 50 years. And during that period of time, they have influenced how many other people, they have taught how many other people, this has gone, and then now there's enough people to sort of try to be more realistic about themselves and about the, about the world and the environment. You know? And um, we really, and, the, and the, the young are, it's so wonderful, isn't it? Uh, uh, Mona Chopra, your question, you know, the young people with Gre behind Greta Thunberg and many others, they're out there telling this older stuck baby boomer generation that is still pumping out the gas and the oil and the coal even. Um, they're saying, forget it, you know. The, this, we, you, you're wrecking our future, you know. You know, get, your, get, get off your chair, get off your meditation cushion if necessary and do something active to change this world, you know. You know, because you're ruining, you're, what did she say, Greta Thunberg? You, you're selling our future. You're destroying our future to make a buck. She, she, she sort of said, you know, in the UN, I think. When Trump went in and walked by her, Trump couldn't look at her. I don't know if you noticed that. He walked right by her. And then she got quite livid. <laughs> Poor Greta. <laughs> She's so great, though. She's truly mindful and great. She is, you know, but, but her, her mindfulness is the kind of mindfulness of an oracle. She's a natural oracle. And she feels all these animals who are being killed and dying. She really does. She always speaks up for the extinction and for the animals, you know, and for how we are ruthlessly wrecking their lives, you know, and their, their ecosystem that they live in and so on, just for some immediate gratification of our own. And she, I feel that she's a true oracle, you know. And uh, if she was in Tibet, they would give her a helmet and a little mirror and some feathers and some plumes, and she'd get all right in the face, and and she would say what she says, and the older people wouldn't dare sneer at her. They would not, because she's channeling Mother Earth, you know, channeling the. The, the 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 people who are sending up their viruses, you know, because the the network of animals that used to absorb and take care of those things for us has been shattered by us, you know, and uh, and therefore they're these zoonotic. I think they call it zoonotic viruses are just getting started. You know, zoo zoonotic come from the zoo. Zoonotic viruses. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Any other question? Da -da. We've got a great question from um, one of our frequent guests about getting sleep. And if you ha either of you have any practices for those who struggle with sleep, 
or practices for those who work as caregivers. As people who face difficulty sleeping and people who want a practice for, to, for people doing caregiving during the pandemic and helping those that are ill. Is this our, are these our last questions, Justin? Because these are these, these are, are the closing okay, questions. I was I was thinking okay, we about people having trouble sleeping, and who and also for caregivers. Uh, sure. Well, what, well, Sharon. Yeah, I mean, for sleeping, my favorite actually is uh, something someone told me who has terrible insomnia. She said, "You know, when you do loving kindness practice, which you may or may not be familiar with." Instead of resting your attention on the feeling of the breath, you rest your attention. One way of doing it is you rest your attention on the silent repetition of certain phrases. And the spirit is like gift giving or offering, like maybe happy, maybe peaceful. So when this friend can't sleep, she lies in bed. And first she does loving kindness for all beings who are awake. Not metaphorically, but literally. So that includes her but it also includes maybe water buffalo in India and people going to work, you know, the other end of the world. And, and she just keeps repeating those phrases with those kind of images. And then after a while, she does loving kindness for all beings who are asleep, which does not include her, but presumably includes her neighbors and her, her village or whatever, you know. So uh, it's like fun. It channels the more anxious energy, the fretful energy into something positive and it there's something about those hours when the earth is quieter on our side you know and and there's a feeling of um connection that's not attenuated by all the hustle and bustle you know so uh i think it's um kind of interesting to experiment with and in terms of caregiving um there's a lot, you know, like a lot of uh, the issues with caregiving, um, as with activism, you know, activists, is that uh, you probably have a great deal of empathy and compassion going. That's why you do what you do, but maybe not directed at yourself as well. There's often some imbalance there. It feels selfish to take care of yourself in any way, to take a break, to have a sense of limits. That's wisdom, you know, that we're not in control of the universe. We can't walk in and say, poof, you're all better. It's all better. And so uh, the emphasis is sometimes on loving kindness for oneself or um, having a, a clearer sense of just seeing the expectations in your mind and the... Um, maybe impossible standards that you're trying to hold yourself to and things like that. So it's a lot of uh, loving kindness for self and almost like equanimity in relation to others. Like I will do everything that I can to try to ease your situation and I'm not in control of the universe. You know, things are as they are and something like that. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful advice. I might add, uh, I, I, uh, with a counter question, does the person with that question who has sleep issues, do they do a lot of exercise? And uh, there's, I have a body worker and he has ordered me from some time back to walk two miles a day without fail if I want to live a long life. And uh, I don't manage to get that done every time. But anytime I do walk even one mile or do a few miles on a stationary bike in the house, uh, then I do sleep easier that night for sure. So the body needs to, uh, and if they, if they are, if they are a, high, a heavy exerciser, strong exerciser and still have trouble sleeping, then of course, whatever, you know, Sharon said is absolutely right. And it's a, it's an amazing thing. I, I like to recommend that people think about uh, where they're going to be once they've fallen asleep because possibly some people have a subliminal thing about fear to fall asleep because falling asleep is the one time that you completely become vulnerable. You no longer have a sense of your boundary. You become unconscious. Anything could happen to you. You don't know what it is. 
And so if you're being anxious, then that, that will say, even if your door is locked and there's, you know, you're in a safe house and blah, 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 good neighborhood, and dark and nice, cozy, temperature is good, everything is good. But there's some fear of being completely helpless, really, which you are when you're asleep. And also, I think possibly it could be a subliminal idea because of the very irrational teaching we get from our science teachers in our whole school and our culture that the ground of reality is nothingness. And when you fall asleep, you go with, you think you seem to go into a dark space. So maybe there's a subliminal fear of being obliterated and never coming back from the nothingness. And so there I recommend thinking of uh, either a monotheistic idea that the deepest energy of the universe is God and God is love and God is light or something like that. Or in Buddhism, we have a concept called clear light of the void or the sort of great loving energy of, of all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas as the base of the universe. And uh, as, as they're waiting for you that you only can receive the blessing of that when you're unconscious because normally you're so closed. And so don't think you lie in a dark space. Sort of condition yourself to think about it, study, read the, the writings of the mystics who have discovered the great light of the divine or the clear light of the void in the case of the Buddhas and, uh, or the great supreme self and the oneness with God in the Hinduism. And, uh, and sort of encourage yourself that once you let go by becoming unconscious, you will be embraced by the nourishing light of the great mother or the great father or the whatever it is, whatever it is or both of them, <laughs> whatever it is. And uh, sort of sort of recondition by, you don't know what your unconscious thinks about what's going to happen to you when you fall asleep, but that might be what's preventing it from doing it. And so do it. And then of course, then if meditation fails and if all this thinking fails, there's always medication, good old Ambien. And a little bit of Ambien, like a half or a quarter of an Ambien might help you like turn the corner there. And it's not going to really harm you. But if, if you have to do it all the time and you take a whole pill or more, then that's bad. So don't do that. But, <laughs> but uh, a little tiny thing uh, sometimes will just tip you over and then your body will be so grateful because you slept in the morning that you might gravitate more easily to sleep the next time. Okay, so that's great. So I think, you know, we're coming close to the time. There are a lot of questions. I wanted to ask, there's one question of Samantha, that I was a little Samantha Cook on the Q&A, where you're a little worried because you're such a great meditator. And uh, the nun who told you to stop and don't go further without a teacher to help guide you, I think she gave you good advice. So this is a question, everybody, unless you can all see it, where Samantha says she, from childhood she was able to go very strongly into kind of samadhi and she, when you said she would go straight into the light i hope it was a nice light it was a, not too bright and it was fr it was friendly and you were happy and felt energized afterwards i hope so and you had and you had experience in which you could not break out of meditation in that case maybe you felt trapped and that's not good so i think you definitely should um uh should uh, follow that advice and find a guide and a therapist or a meditation teacher, um, depending on how, how much this bothers you, um, and, uh, and actually try to make it, take advantage of this special gift that you have. But, do, but I wouldn't do it by yourself. You know, I want to say about myself that when I was um, 20 years old and first really starting to practice Buddhism, I had been studying it already for a few years at that point, but I was really trying to practice it, and I really wanted to meditate, and I started having this like you did. I would just leave the body in a shot, and I was thrilled. I was so excited to do it. And my teacher kept interrupting me and preventing me from doing it. And I was so annoyed with him, I even ran off and tried to hide in the woods and meditate under a tree so he wouldn't find me. And he did find me. <laughs> he would come and say, what are you? People will think you're homeless if you stay out here. Come on, let's back in and have some yogurt and go to sleep. And he just constantly interrupted me. And only years later, I finally realized that it was very good because sometimes you have an affinity like that. And, and then, but then you kind of can get stuck. 
you know, into some sort of, because you don't know how to do the transition, you know. So you shouldn't do it too quickly, go into some out-of-body states and things like that. You, you should, it's not that they're not precious and valuable, they are. But you have to build up a way of understanding them that kind of ahead of time so you don't misinterpret them and you don't feel stuck in them and this kind of thing. So, so you, you definitely, the nun gave you the right advice, absolutely. And I wouldn't bother with the Rinpoche. That's too advanced. I mean, the long term, what he said is a good idea, but that, that kind of high teaching. But initially, I think you need a more basic guide uh, than some high Mahamudra, where the whole universe, you embrace the whole universe type of thing. That's again, uh, could, it's not, you know, you need to, bit by step by step, you know, Bill Murray's famous Buddhist precept. One of my gurus is Bill Murray in the movie, What About Bob? You should always watch that. Everyone should go see that movie as homework. And it wasn't about me, but it was just, his name was Bob. What about Bob? It was called. And, and uh, he used to go around when he would go somewhere for the weekend, he would take his goldfish in a little plastic bag and he'd look at the goldfish and then he'd get on the bus or he'd go somewhere and he'd just constantly say, baby steps, baby steps. You know, it, it was supposed to be a little bit of a psychological case, but you'll see what happens in the movie. It's very cute. It's actually quite sane. But anyway, he's always saying baby steps, baby steps, baby steps, bit by bit. Everything is bit by bit. Don't overdo it. Big trick is to pretend to just really, oh, I'm going to go over to Nirvana in a minute and then collapse and then decide there's no such thing and get all discouraged. Okay, so Sharon, any, would you like to give us a last? Uh, uh, no, I think thank you all so much, blessing. Thank you, Bob. I think your presence is the blessing, Sharon. It really, uh -huh. it is. Let's do it again sometime. It's so much fun. What? Let's do it again sometime. It's yes, so much fun. Do. But we used to do a lot. We did, but with the COVID now we can easily do without travel. Yeah. I was even going to ask you maybe just, you know, our New Year's thing. But we want to have a few more things at New Year's and just to we'll say it's not going to be in person probably. Yeah. yeah. The way things are going. So, I, I, you know, you don't have to worry about the ice and the snow. <laughs> we can just come on. Yeah, that's excellent. Good come news. Minute, you know, <laughs> and uh, and we'll we'll meet again with all of these people with uh, Saturday Night Live. I don't know. I think we're not funny enough. But, you know, we could do, uh, you know, uh, Sharon could imitate... Uh, Never mind. Never mind. I could imitate somebody, but never mind. I won't. <laughs> I won't do it. I won't do it. All I right. Do it because we're gonna. We're gonna have. We're gonna all go out and vote. <laughs> have a landslide, and therefore the the um, three. By that time, there could be three Supreme Court justices, who who got noticed by the Republican right wingers who appointed them, because they fought in Florida with the law to block Gore's vote count, three of them. That's how they got noticed and climbed in the hierarchy of uh, legal, legal appointees because they stopped Gore's votes from being counted. That's what they did. The media doesn't mention that. They're so pathetic, their research. But all three of them became, came to light because of that. And, the, and so that's a plan, you know, but that plan will not work with a landslide. So we want to hope to have it so we don't have a lot of uncertainty and a lot of stress, more stress. We want to have less stress. And, uh, and uh, we really do. And we need, we need someone to, to cause an industrial emergency for testing so that there's, everybody can have tests on every street corner and many times a day if necessary, many times a week, and, that, and contact tracing using, putting uh, Mark Zuckerberg to work doing contact tracing instead of spreading stupid ideas and nasty, violent plots and things. That's what Facebook should be doing right now. Absolutely, if they were really patriotic, they would be doing that. And that can be done, that will be done, and that will get there, you know. Okay, so a lot of luck, everybody, and thank you all for showing up, and thank you especially, Sharon, for your precious time and for your nice smile. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Justin and Eli. For your help in, in we're organizing and um, okay oh my pay home by the virtue of doing this may we all quickly become our hats in honor of the burmese tradition and therefore in order to help every else become an arhat become a become happy that it means our hat means happy okay all the best thank you <laughs> okay. good night good night everyone
This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit our websites at tibethouse.us or menla.org.